Hi everyone, hope you are doing well. We are going to be continuing our poetry videos um, this week. Um, all lecture videos this week are looking at the poems that you have been scheduled to read throughout the week. Um, we're going to start today with um, the two poems, one from Philip Levine called Coming Close, and the other from Adam Zagajewski called Tried to Praise the Mutilated World. Um, the goal of today um, and why we're reading these poems and the skill we want to learn from them is comes down to getting closer to our reader. In the last video, uh, the last two videos, and look at the poems, we talked about inviting your reader into the scene, getting your reader to read um, your description of your topic, of your scene, of your action, so that they could say, wow, I, I know what it's like. I could sense it. I can picture it. I also can feel how the writer feels about it. Now, today we're going to add to that purpose, I guess you could say. That's the purpose of those two skill practices to get closer to your reader. We're going to add, sorry, to invite your reader into the scene. Now we're going to get your reader even closer uh, to take maybe even some personal responsibility or to feel connected to your subject matter or your topic on a deeper level. Um, so let me go first quickly to the humbling lens uh, reading that you did. Uh, and this was from the audio, so it's drunk in white packet. And I'm just going to read the first paragraph and um, we'll talk about this for a second and then we're going to move on to the poems. So humbling lens is about writing in the second person, about using the you. It says the second person point of view, using you or command imperative form verbs, has often been limited to instruction manuals, process or how-to essays, advice columns, and personal letters. But the humbling lens can be used in unexpected ways to get a group to accept responsibility or to gain readers empathy. Second person point of view establishes an up and close personal relationship between writer and reader. Wiping out the comfort zone provided by the third person, which is called distancing lens. We make use of this in-your-face intensity during emotional exchanges. If we suspect a person is being unsympathetic, how would you feel if Aunt Tina did this to you? Our accusations are often accompanied by literally aiming our forefinger at the other person. With a humbling lens, an essayist can figuratively finger point without breaching etiquette by addressing the reader as you. So, um, we're going to use that foundation to talk about these two poems today in your next writing practice. But I did also just want to point out that many of you have probably been told not to write an essay with the second person point of view. That you were told not to write an essay with the first person, I. Uh, that it needs to remain third person in order to be academic, in order to maybe fit the formula of writing that you've been taught in previous writing classes. But in this class, not just in these short descriptions that we're writing at the beginning of the quarter, but in our essays that we'll write throughout the quarter, you are very much encouraged to and allowed to use you and I and they and he and she. We're going to talk about using multiple different pronouns when we write and finding a way to control them, make choices on when to use them to have a positive effect on your reader. So that was the first note, just we're able to use the you in this class and we're able to use the I, as many of you probably did in the first two writing practices so far. Um, with that said, uh, that short little paragraph reiterated what I said at the opening, that you can use the second person specifically the imperative sentence structure, which we're going to talk about in a second, to either get your reader to feel responsible for the subject matter you're writing about, feel connected to on a deeper level, or maybe even feel empathy for the subject matter. And that's what we're going to see in Coming Close, taking responsibility and feeling empathy. First note before we look at Philip Levine's poem, is to look at what an imperative sentence is, just so we're all on the same page. Right, very straightforward. 
This is just uh, to remind you of the different type of sentences that we have to use. We have three different types. There's actually four, but I left exclamatory out. Um, so we have a declarative sentence, which makes a statement. We have an interrogative sentence, which asks a question. And then we have imperative sentences, and they make commands. So I gave a couple quick examples, just so we can see the difference. The declarative sentence makes a statement. He looked out the window mindlessly. Um, I literally just chose that sentence because I was looking out the window mindlessly. <laughs> then we have the interrogative, which asks a question. What was he watching as he looked mindlessly out the window? And then lastly, we have the imperative. It's a command. And it just says, look out the window. Now, the one thing we need to note about this is who the subject of an imperative sentence is. Because the subject of these two sentences was he. It was he. I could change that to I. I looked out the window mindlessly. What was I watching as I looked out the mindlessly out the window? Now, though you might technically be able to command yourself to do something, most often, pretty much all of the time, a command or an imperative sentence is a command towards another person. And, and literally, in an imperative sentence, there's an implied you. You don't say you. You don't have to say you. Um, but it's implied when you say, look out the window, that you are speaking directly to someone or to a group of people, and you're commanding them to do this action. And so there's an implied you. I wouldn't say look out the window and, you know, be talking to a third person indirectly. I'm talking to a specific person or set of people and commanding them to do something. Almost like directing their attention, pointing a finger at them, like the audios reading said. So we're going to look at Philip Levine and coming close first. And we're going to look at how he uses the you, but also how he uses imperatives and how he does this to not only have an effect on the reader that draws us closer to his subject matter, but also makes us feel responsible for his topic and also make me really feel empathy for his topic. And so um, as we talk about the Philip Levine poem today and point out these imperatives, we're also going to talk about the purpose of that poem, something we didn't do in the first four poems we looked at, but we're going to start talking about what, what what Philip Levine was trying to say, what we see he was trying to achieve for his readers, because the imperative is so important to that purpose. All right, I'm just going to get out of here. Get out of here. And let's just turn to our poems. So, I'll actually read this. And as I read it, just follow along and maybe see if you can underline where you see he's making a command or speaking directly to the reader, just to take note of where it's happening. Because one thing we want to do when we look back at this poem is to say, what is Philip Levine trying to make us feel responsible for? What comfort zone is he trying to call us out of? What is he trying to make us feel empathy for? And looking at the imperatives will help us answer that. Coming close. Take this quiet woman. She has been standing before a polishing wheel for over three hours, and she lacks 20 minutes before she can take a lunch break. Is she a woman? Consider the arms as they press the long brass tube against the buffer. They are striated along the triceps, the three heads of which clearly show. Consider the fine dusting of dark down above the upper lip and the beads of sweat that run from under the red kerchief across the brow and are wiped away with a blackening wristband in one odd motion a child might make to say, no, no. You must come closer to find out. You must hang your tie and jacket in one of the lockers in favor of a black smock. You must be prepared to spend shift after shift hauling off the metal trays of stock, bowing first, knees bent for a purchase, then lifting with a gasp the first word of tenderness between the two of you. 
then you must bring new trays of dull, unpolished tubes. You must feed her, as they say in the language of the place. Make no mistake, the place has a language, and if by some luck the power were cut, the wheel slowed to a stop so that you suddenly saw it was not a solid object, but so many separate bristles forming in motion, a perfect circle. She would turn to you and say, why? Not the old why, why must I spend five nights a week, just why? Even if by some magic you knew, you wouldn't dare speak for fear of her laughter, which now you have anyway, as she places the five tapering fingers of her filthy hand on the arm of your white shirt to mark you for your own, now and forever. I love this poem. This is such a good poem. It, it definitely makes you respond as a reader. It has an emotional effect uh, that's more maybe obvious than the first couple poems we read. Um, and I think it is very much because of the you and the imperatives here that are commanding us to pay attention to certain things. It draws us closer and has a stronger effect on us. So as you noticed, um, there are a number of commands and addresses to the you in this poem, and let's just take note of them real fast. Uh, take this quiet woman is where he starts. Instead of saying, look at this quiet woman, he says, take. And that might go back to our lesson about word choice to establish tone and attitude. Take has quite a different feel than look. Uh, we have consider. He's asking us to think about or to pay attention to, and he does it twice. So take this quiet woman, consider her arms, consider the dust on her upper lip. Uh, before I move on, this is a good point to note that uh, as you use imperatives in your next skill practice, you want to use them to uh, introduce specific detail. So even if you took um, the five senses and turn them into commands. Look at this quiet woman. Listen to this quiet woman. Touch this quiet woman. Uh, <laughs> what are the other ones? Smell this quiet woman, which would be a little weird. Uh, you get the point. You can use the senses to command your reader to experience some specific description or specific thing that that sense is representing. Um, so if you look at all three of these, they have a, an imperative and then they're followed by very specific description. Look at that. Consider or look at or think about, and then we get very close detail of the arms, the buffer, the triceps, the, the, the form of the triceps. And then of course here, very close detail of uh, the dust, uh, of her sweat, of her kerchief. Of her action. So using the imperative to drive new detail, new physical concrete detail, is one way to use imperatives here. Uh, let's keep going because at this point we, we come a little, well, we get to a different kind of command. So you might have noticed these addresses to the you. Now they're not true imperatives like these first three are, but they pretty much are commands. You must. The you must stands in for just saying, come closer. It almost exaggerates the command a little bit, that you must, you must. And there are quite a number of them, right? You must come closer. You must be prepared. You must bring. You must feed her. I'm not sure if I missed any. Um, then we have make no mistake, it's another command. And that's it. Um, so we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight commands in this poem. Um, again, looking at these commands, they drive specific action. Now, if these ones drove specific detail, just getting us to look at something concrete, uh, these drive specific action. Again, using these imperatives not only to get your reader closer, but also to deliver close detail is how we want to use them in our own writing. Um, so we, we've noticed these, 
And then we want to just note quickly, what is the point? Why this way in, instead of a different way? Why didn't the speaker of this poem share his own personal experience? We already saw Philip Levine in Fear and Fame sharing his own personal experience of the work he did with the eye. So this poem could have easily been like, I look at this quiet woman who has been standing before a polishing mill. I consider the arms as they press the long brass tube. I consider the fine dusting of dark. I come closer to find out. We always want to ask when we read something, why did not why did the read, writer do it this way? Why didn't they do it another way? What is the effect of doing it this way over the other way? That's looking closely at the how. So why? What is he trying to do? We have to think about the subject matter of this poem really quickly. The subject matter of this poem is a woman who is doing very, very, very difficult work. Work that you or I would not want to do. Um, it's it's repetitive. She just stands there and polishing over and over and over. Um, she can't even take a lunch break. She has to wait. She has to wait. She has to just keep working. Uh, we know from the end of the poem that there's these questions. Oh, why must I do this? It's hard work. We don't want to have to do it. Um, the audience who, like us, doesn't want to do this work, doesn't would not enjoy this work, we're told a little bit about them. They have uh, a white shirt. They have um, a tie and jacket. Uh, and those are pretty much the couple details we get about them. So very quickly, we can understand that the audience that Philip Levine is addressing is like the you in this poem, someone who has a comfortable job, who has a certain degree of wealth, a certain degree of comfort in the work they do. Maybe we call them a white collar worker. They wear a suit, a tie, and a white shirt to work. And that's contrasted against this woman, of course, who, who's working manual labor in a factory. So what's the point of this poem? Why is Philip Levine using these imperatives to get us closer? What is he trying to make us feel responsible for? I think it's very easy to say one of the purposes of this poem is to make us feel responsible for people who suffer in this kind of work. Oftentimes in this world, we don't think about people who do really hard labor. We don't stop to empathize with them and say, that must be hard. We're just content to say, oh, we got it better. We've got it good. Uh, I like what I have as work to do in my life. So it's asking us to, to feel responsible for maybe what this woman endures. Now, maybe responsibility, though, isn't the pressing concern for Levine. Maybe it's just empathy to feel for her. So we ask the question, how does he get us to feel for her? Well, first, he commands us to pay attention. He commands us to see her, to look at her very closely. The whole first part of the poem, he's making us look very closely at her. That's the first step in making us empathize with her. Now the poem then moves to this section of You Must, where the you in the poem has to literally get in her shoes. That's a good way to define empathy. Empathy is putting yourself in someone else's situation to feel it, to understand it. And that's what's going on here. The speak, the, the, the you in the poem, which is us as the reader, because as we read this, we hear you, you, you. We have to literally dress the way she dresses. We have to do the things she does in this job. We're literally put in her shoes and in the situation so that we can feel it, so that we can empathize with it. So this is what the imperatives are doing in this poem. They're making us look closely at her. They're making us act and get in her shoes. And all of that's being done to make us feel empathy towards her. And maybe when we feel empathy for her, we're more likely to pay attention to her, to feel responsible for her. So that's as far as we'll go with the purpose of this poem. Um, but I'll just remind you, using imperatives in your next skill practice to drive specific detail and to engage your reader. 
more closely is what you're trying to accomplish. Uh, I'll quickly move to um, the Adam Zagajewski poem and um, point out one, again, one difference between this poem and the last one. Um, not for the purposes of your skill practice, but maybe for the purposes of understanding poetry and how to analyze poetry, which is something we'll do later in the quarter. I'll point out this first. Some poems, they don't tell you what they're about. I'll actually go back here. This poem doesn't say, this poem is about making the reader feel responsible for the hardships of other people that work difficult jobs. And this poem wants to make them feel empathy towards her. It does not say that. We know that by how it is written and what the effect of how it's written is on us, that we can uh, interpret or we can, we can assess what the poem is trying to say. Now, that's most poems we've read so far. On the other hand, we have a poem like Try to Praise the Mutilated World, and it directly pretty much tells us what it's about in the title and then five times throughout the poem. What is the point of this poem? The point of this poem is to try to convince the reader that they should try to praise the mutilated world. So we have this terrible world we live in where all these bad things are constantly happening. You read the news and you're just constantly <clears throat> overwhelmed by what's going on. And we have this writer saying, we got to try to praise it. We got to praise it. We got to remember the good things. We got to hold on to the joyful things, to the things that bring us pleasure in the midst of all the suffering. And so he pretty much tells us what it's about. And so this kind of poem, when we interpret it, we can jump right to the, the meaning or the message or the purpose of the poem. And then we can look to how that message is achieved. Do we believe it? Do we, at the end of the poem, want to praise the mutilated world? Or do we not believe it? Did he move us to act or not? Um, and so one thing I would point out because we're talking about imperatives, is how the imperatives move here. And that's all we'll talk about. We'll return to this poem later on in the quarter, but for now, just some imperatives. You know, they're in the title, and then they come throughout the poem. Try to praise, try to praise. Um, you must praise. Um, you should praise. Remember. Is also a command. Oh, we have one up here too. I forgot. It's commanding us to remember. Um, return in thought, which is another way to say remember, and then praise. So here we also have a number of imperatives one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Three of them are telling us to remember. And what I love is that each of them tells us to remember something specific physical concrete detail. So again, using the imperatives to drive physical concrete detail, like June's long days, wild strawberries, drops of rosé, the nettles growing over the abandoned homestead, um, music, acorns in the park, all this stuff, great detail. But then we have these other commands, and, and these commands align with the purpose of the poem. And I like how they change. We have try to, try to, you must, you should, and then simply praise. I want you to ask yourself, what is the effect of that sequence? What if the poem would have just stayed with try to the whole time? Try to praise, try to praise, try to praise, try to praise. Would that have been effective to you? What if it just said praise the whole time? Praise, 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 praise. Would that have been effective? I want to say that no, it would not have been as effective. <clears throat> Excuse me. What we see here is a uh, intensification. Try to kind of has that feeling or that tone of giving you an option. You might not be able to, but you can try to. And so it invites the reader kind of without commanding them in too harsh a way. Um, but then very quickly we get to, you must praise. Okay, now i got to pay attention a little bit more. Why must I? 
And then he, he kind of backs off. Well, you should praise. It still gives you a little bit of a choice, but it also is a proposal to do something. And then he ends simply with praise. It's no longer trying to. It's no longer telling you you must. It's simply saying praise. And the focus becomes on the praise. I believe that has a specific effect that I want you just to consider on your own. And also see this as a way to give variety to the imperatives that you write. So um, that's it for this video. Um, that's it for this video today. I hope that was useful for you as you walk into your next writing exercise, the imperative skill practice. And um, can't wait to read those. Until the next video, I'll see you soon. Bye.